Breaking Bread is brought to you by North York Community House, an organization that builds strong, resilient, and inclusive communities in Northwest Toronto. It's time for a shift. This is the shift. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. My name is Kadeen Bankasing, and I'll be your host for this episode of Breaking Bread, Stories of Black Communities in Transition. Our limited podcast series seeks to take a deeper dive into redevelopment and uncover the truth about this phenomenon in the city of Toronto. Throughout this journey, we'll be speaking to residents, community leaders, and industry experts who will shed light on the experiences of those living through these major transitions and take a deeper dive into the real consequences of urban redevelopment. This is episode two of Breaking Bread, Stories of Black Communities in Transition. In our previous episode of Breaking Bread, we set out on our journey of exploring what urban redevelopment and revitalization is in the city of Toronto. We talked with Cuddy Duncan, current director of strategic initiatives at North York Community House, who helped ground some of the key concepts surrounding redevelopment and urban revitalization. We also spoke to Lawrence Heights resident and community leader, Denise Bishop Earl, who enlightened us on her experiences living through the revitalization happening in her community. Today, we'll further investigate the latter, specifically the various impacts revitalization has on the key stakeholders involved. Today, we are joined by Shannon Spencer, who works in the industry and has studied urban planning to help us better understand the outcomes of revitalization and their impacts on the community. So, Shannon Spencer, can you um, introduce and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks, Kadeen. So, my name is Shannon, and currently, I am a community development coordinator at North York Community House. I work closely with residents, uh, particularly in Lawrence Heights and Neptune, uh, which are two areas that are currently undergoing a multi-phase revitalization project that is impacting a lot of people. So in my job, I mostly support residents in these communities to really use and like build on their strengths, uh, their networks and assets to be more involved and knowledgeable about the revive process and also to develop their community uh, engage in collective visioning visioning and also you know to identify the things that they want to see and the things that they need in their community and i also support uh, various community and grassroots groups and coalitions uh, with uh, local initiatives and programs Oh, that sounds very exciting and interesting. I just want <laughs> yes. to uh, like go just a little bit further and ask you, why is this uh, work like uh, that you're doing with communities and even with your background in urban planning? Why is it important to you personally? For me personally, so as you mentioned, I have a background in urban planning. And when I just got into urban planning, when I decided to study urban planning uh, at a tertiary level, I was really interested uh, in people's interactions uh, with cities and space. So that's my initial you know, um, interest in urban planning. But as I began to study urban planning and be more, get, gain more experience, I've realized a lot of uh, the urban planning processes and policies really exclude the communities and the people that live in them and that they're supposed to be planning for. And that just didn't really sit right with me. And that's why I kind of took took a more like a, a bit of a turn. Uh, urban planning is broad, but I wanted to focus more on community development. And also, I really love helping people. So bridge that together and really working at a local level with the people to help advocate for the things that they want in their community uh, and also to help influence some of those planning processes to make sure that the communities are livable for the people that are there and not just like blind policies and placeholder policies that don't really take into consideration the people, you know, 
and the residents that live there. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think you also started probably to answer a little bit of the next question um, as well. So can you tell us a little bit more about your relationship to redevelopment communities in Toronto? Yeah, so uh, my relationship, uh, as I mentioned, is through a lot of my work. And I work quite a lot with residents and a long time residents as well, too. So I hear a lot of stories, uh, especially about in Lawrence Heights, of what Lawrence Heights used to be. Uh, I know how much it has changed in such a short amount of time due to the redevelopment and revitalization that's going on there. And even while working at Niche, uh, Niche North York Community House, uh, I started off as a student placement uh, uh, and then through a volunteer. And now I work here full time. And in these past few years, I've seen a lot of these changes happening, like physical changes happening. Uh, it's it's feel like it's been, it's like a whiplash. It's going so quickly and so fast, right? And, also hearing some of the stories about, you know, not only the physical changes of places, you know, being torn down and spaces being lost, but also some of the cultural and, you know, and historical heritage um, stories as well too that I hear about the place. And a lot of the residents, you know, feeling quite excluded and left out from the whole revitalization process and people being pushed out. And that hearing those stories and those personal narratives really truly brings the reality of the social effects of uh, redevelopment a bit of like a I guess a human touch to all this technical um, stuff but I also live and commute quite a lot in the Eglinton West area which is also another neighborhood that's undergoing through a lot of redevelopment due to the LRT line that they're putting in there a lot of construction a lot of traffic constant detours pedestrian routes and having to j cross the road because the sidewalk is closed off so many businesses are being blocked off by construction and machinery uh, and they're losing customers and having to close down and just seeing that um, not only like through work at, in, in lawrence heights but also in the place where i live um i'm having that work but also that um, you know personal experience as well too of seeing redevelopment in you know in these Toronto communities. Thank you. That's quite impactful. So it's like also you know the experience of of working alongside other communities and residents, hearing mm -hmm. from them, learning from them, having to support them to to be able to respond or to understand what's happening and then also experiencing um redevelopment in your personal life and what it means to how you're able to like navigate <laughs> your mm -hmm. own world you know whether it's just the shops you want to go to or the um or how you're going to get to work every day with transit and stuff mm -hmm. so i'm really interested then in um hearing from you more about how you understand see and experience these impacts you started to speak to some of them already but maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what residents are saying um th they're experiencing and and more of what you are experiencing as well yeah so with redevelopment and revitalization I, the basically the aim of it is to like bring a bronx about physical change or to rebuild an area to, and I say this with air quotes, you can't see it, but with air quotes to improve livelihoods and also to bring about new life in the community. And to undergo projects as such as big as like, for example, Lawrence Heights or even Regent Park, there's so many different aspects and so many changes that have to occur to achieve that, you know, overall arching or overarching goal of redevelopment. So there's a lot of demolition of buildings and houses, you know, construction that seems to go on for forever. A lot of, as I mentioned before, traffic, detours, and a lot of noise, like the list goes on. And the redevelopment process and the aftermath of it, the result that they want to achieve through this process, all have significant impacts on existing residents. And um, when I think about impacts, I think about them, um, you know, it's ongoing but there are some impacts that you see in the short term, right? So you have like more immediate impacts, like, you know, you can see physical change of changes when, you know, 
housing is demolished and businesses and buildings that help businesses and community spaces are no longer around, right? Which I call, which I'd say it contributes to direct displacement. So when I say by direct displacement, I mean that when people are forced to move out or pushed out to make way for new development. So a lot of cases where you have, you know, some of the social housing being torn down that people have to move, uh, whether it's to other housing within the community or even outside of the community, which lends itself to another issue of, you know, community safety as well too, in the case that you are probably relocated to a community which is not necessarily safe for you and your family, or you're probably moved to another unit that's not appropriate for like your family size. Say you have a large family, but then they cram you into this small unit or this small area that's not suitable for your lifestyle or your family, right? And that and all, those are some impacts that you can get from uh, redevelopment. But also you could see on the commercial side as well too, where, you know, a lot of businesses that are, especially local businesses are leasing commercial space where they have no choice to move because, you know, the landlord says, you know, we're redeveloping, time to go. And they don't really have similar or same, the same protections in place versus for like a tenant where, you know, they might have a guarantee to return or could go to another unit. So it's usually, okay, you have to close down, that's it, go lease somewhere else, right? And, you know, they don't always have that relocation options or the money to be able to relocate anywhere. So they just end up closing down. And on a similar note, the loss of public spaces as well too. So, you know, there might've been spaces before within apartment building, buildings or within Toronto community housing buildings where um, you could have like a multi-use space where community used to gather or even recreational spaces where they used to have like, you know, just, it doesn't have to be a dedicated space like a basketball court, just like a sitting in the corner somewhere where people used to hang out on like on a Friday afternoon and chill, you know, not having access to those spaces anymore, whether to be due to construction or like a machinery being there or just being closed off to put something new there. So the loss of those spaces as well too. And as a lot of things that you tend to see happen in the short term, but also moving on the other hand, thinking of more of the long-term processes, you know, whether it's while redevelopment is going on or even in a few months or years after redevelopment, um, one of the things that you see is gentrification, which is basically a process where there is increased investment in a community and uh, it doesn't always have to be redeveloped, but in a case, in a case like this, the redevelopment you know, can lead to gentrification where wealthier businesses and people move in, right? The cost of living goes up, property values go up because you have these new people and new things coming in, right? And again, that also leads to the loss of services, especially services and spaces that were really catered towards the existing residents that live there, especially for residents of color, black people, or low-income households and new and you know newcomers that you know, they lose their services and they lose their spaces. And, you know, that also lends to what I also call on the other side, indirect develop and displacement. So we had direct displacement and now we have indirect displacement. So people are being priced out. They can't, the cost of living increases. They can no longer afford to live in these spaces, right? The housing that is there is no longer available or appropriate for those families, right? They can't afford to live, you know, work, or even sending kids to school there. Uh, also thinking about demographic and cultural changes. So you know, you're bringing in a new, more affluent people, you know, a new, a new group of people as well too. And really thinking about how, how redevelopment and how the whole integration process is executed can really, if it's executed poorly, if it's not done well, it can cause tensions between you know the older residents and the newer residents and really exacerbates like systemic and class and race issues and further contribute to marginalization and othering of the existing tenants who might be you know different or you know from the new people that are coming in so yeah those are i spoke a lot there but <laughs> those are some of the, the impacts i see and some of the things that um a lot of residents that I've spoken to uh, through my work have brought up as well too. 
Wow, thank you, Shannon, very much, because I know I felt impacted just listening to you list off the impacts or the types of impacts. You said direct and indirect ways that people are being displaced. Um, you spoke about the, like, you know, this personal um, changes that people will experience is loss of services, seeing familiar buildings and streets and things. Um, there are even their pathways and routes to get in and out of their community impacted and changing. Um, then you even talked about the, the kind of the commercial ways that uh, really impacted businesses, um, losing customers and and then being priced out and not even <laughs> able to afford and living in a community that you've already, you've always been in. Um, and then even changes to, um, you know, the cultural environmental changes of just the types of relationships and networks. So definitely the impacts are quite significant, quite yeah. significant. I also add as well too that I forgot to mention that like, you know, all these changes happening quickly and over a period of time can have severe impacts on mental health as well too, right? You're already dealing with all these changes, but you know, you sit there wondering, you know, when on my place go next, you know, what happens to me, right? Especially if you're not, you know, being, if you're not involved and not getting the opportunity to be, to be involved in revitalization process and you're trying to organize community, right? It's really stressful and really daunting and could really impact your mental and physical health as well too. So that's another, you know, impact of redevelopment. So redevelopment in fact can even impact our internal and mo very personal mental, you know, health and well-being as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very significant. I wonder then, you know, in all of this, because there's still something that makes redevelopment appealing <laughs> to people <laughs> or the idea, or maybe it's the idea of redevelopment is appealing to communities. And I experienced that in Lawrence Heights where people were like, yes, give us new homes, you know, for instance, because um, the ones we live in right now are old and are need to be repaired or, you know, made new again. So I wanted to ask you what are what are and if there are any benefits, what are those benefits of redevelopment to black communities? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, I always think that there's always like two sides of a coin or maybe I should say multiple perspectives to an issue. And, you know, there is like, to be honest, a lot of redevelopment is driven, you know, it's profit driven, it's numbers, right? They make investments in these communities they get back a lot of money from it. So, I mean, for the developer's perspective, it's like, it's investment, I make money. But as you mentioned as well, too, with redevelopment, uh, you get new buildings, right? Uh, so a lot of these buildings, due to the policies and laws now, they have to be accessible. So things like elevators and ramps and stuff like that. So having these new buildings and having these new housing with, you know, with universal design to help people with, you know, people with disabilities be able to move around and just make life a bit easier. Uh, also, they are you know, laws in place compared to years and years and years ago that deals with, you know, you have to maintain these places and make sure these places are continuously maintained so they don't, you know, get, they, you know, get poorly maintained or, you know, just go into total disrepair that you have to do the whole process of revitalization over again in a few years, right? So, uh, so there's that. That's one good thing about redevelopment because a lot of the newer, uh, legislation that really supports, you know, better housing and more accessible housing and spaces and public spaces could help, you know, make life a little bit easier for some people as well too. And also improve infrastructure. So a lot of large scale redevelopment, such as Lawrence Heights, you know, you get new roads and new sidewalks and pedestrian paths and even sewer systems as well to uh, improve and to help maintain and make you know life there a bit easier and, and I guess in that quotes improve livelihood. There's also access to amenities. Uh, how who has this access is the biggest question. But if <laughs> if if done right and everyone has access, you know, so you might get new recreational and commercial spaces 
new environmental spaces and parks to help beautify the area as well too, all right? And it's also an opportunity redevelopment, an opportunity for residents, existing residents to really advocate and work with all the developers and decision makers in the project to help advocate and negotiate for services and amenities that the community needs and wants through a community benefits uh, agreement process to develop that framework and come together. There's an opportunity to come together to really envision what you want your community to look like and work with someone to be able to advocate and get those things in your community. So change doesn't always have to be bad per <laughs> se, and diversity isn't bad. It's just the key thing, I believe, is how you go about the process, who is included in the process, and being very transparent uh, about what some of those impacts might be and really sitting down to really figure out how you mitigate some of those impacts and reduce some of those impacts. And working together as well, I think, is a very is a very important thing to make sure to reduce some of those negative impacts that you face through redevelopment. Wow, thank you. I like the idea that uh, that rebuilding the city <clears throat> and uh, rebuilding older spaces, you know, enables inclusion and accessibility in ways that uh, they they haven't in the past. So I really, yeah, I kind, I really appreciate. Um, that is a benefit. I want to ask you, have mm -hmm. residents in your conversations with residents, because I know you were very, you know, um, spoke very passionately about the ways they've stated they've been impacted, maybe mm -hmm. in challenging ways. But have you heard from residents, you know, things that they're looking forward to or feeling um, hopeful about in these redevelopments? I think one of the things that I hear a lot from residents that I look forward to is definitely having a community center, a community space uh, for recreational purposes, but also to be able to have space for like grassroots groups and to, for community events as well too, uh, and possibility of the programs that might come with that space. So I think that's a big thing that residents talk to talk about quite a lot. Uh, that everyone seems to be really excited about, uh, which hopefully works out, <laughs> uh, that comes up. But also just having also that accessibility, going back to the accessibility points again, having elevators and making buildings more accessible and easier to live in. And again, this also de really depends on, you know, the quality of the build. Uh, so making sure, you know, the developers and the construction are held accountable to make sure that the, when they build these places and they, they build up to the standard for accessibility that they use the materials and the, uh, and the things needed to be able to make these spaces great. But a lot of people are also, you know, appreciative of having newer buildings that are more accessible. Yeah, that's kind of cool that it's actually quite hopeful um, to hear that community members are still looking forward to what's possible, you know, out of these redevelopments and getting new spaces that will enable them to do their work or to have healthy relationships and to have healthy communities, you know, which in many ways is what a community center represents to me, you know, healthy community, people where people, places where people can gather and, and, or, um, generally be and show up and know that they can access in ways that that are useful for them or valuable so yeah. um, it's interesting that despite you know the challenges um, that people are still there's still so much that they're looking forward to mm -hmm. yeah yeah and it's great for like especially for the community space and the community center is that you know it should be accessible to everyone so whether with, with Lawrence Heights or with the revitalization there'll be on top of the rental housing and the social housing, there'll also be a lot of market rate units coming in as well too. So as I mentioned before, there could be that tension between, you know, the renters versus the, you know, owners, but um, coming, having a space for people to get together and engage in activities or events together and really build those relationships can help, you know, 
contribute to better social networks and you know reduce that tension and how you know really build your community mm -hmm. excellent so i know that you did this um already in an earlier question <laughs> would you <laughs> define gentrification for us again please sure so uh gentrification is basically um when you have increased investment and this investment doesn't necessarily always have to be through a large scale redevelopment uh it could be just like through renovations or introducing you know new businesses or new um services to the area but basically when you have increased investment into a community or an area that causes sort of like a shift or transformation uh, which leads to social, cultural, economic changes uh, that brings more affluent or wealthier people and businesses into, uh, into the community or into the area. So it's not only people, but also businesses, the commercial side also comes in and you know, the place evolves. And a lot of times is true gentrification uh, you tend to see, you know, a lot of displacement happening uh, directly and directly. And uh, it's been happening all over Toronto, uh, especially for the case of like, you know, the commercial side of things where you see places like uh, Yorkdale Mall or even the Lawrence Allen Center, <laughs> uh, where, you know, you see a lot of mom and pops closing down and you have these designer brands and expensive food and clothing, clothing places come in. Uh, and a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, social consequences of gentrification, which are very similar to general impacts of um, redevelopment, but it's usually driven by profit, you know, like profit driven processes. So a lot of development and renovation um, that contributes to gentrification, but basically you bring the rich and wealthy people in and you know that that has impacts on the existing residents especially those of lower income that final that actually i wonder i wonder if mm -hmm. uh because as you said it really starts with investment and mm -hmm. investment in various in various forms right like investment doesn't look the same every time you mentioned mm -hmm. so is there a particular site or what are some of the features of, um, or characteristics, if you will, of the place where um, these investments generally land or happen? So that's a good, that's a good question. A lot of it, unfortunately, happens to be in lower income neighborhoods, uh, which tends to be, you know, also a lot of neighborhoods that have a lot of black uh, people or people of color um because they see it as you know a place that they could recreate and turn into something new and again new in quotes and you know this place has potential and you know we can create it into something that people you know find attractive you know so basically <laughs> unfortunately a lot of these places you know a lot of these places as well to so all these communities uh they exist, they have a lot of what I call disinvestment that led them to this state that they're in and the conditions that they're in is because, you know, they're not maintained. Uh, they're, I don't want to say neglected, because I, I put it neglected, <laughs> strong word, um, you know, infrastructure is breaking down, you know, housing is not great, buildings are not great because there's that, because the government, there's a lack of government uh, investment to really maintain the area, private businesses come in and see it as a place that they can recreate for their profits. Uh, I don't know if that was understandable, but a lot of those places tend to be, unfortunately, uh, Black communities, people, places of low income communities, um, places where there's a lot of newcomers as well, too. Uh, and that seems to be the trend that's been happening all across North America. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it was important just to define what some of those, because investment, you know, investments is one thing, but what then, uh, what are some of the features of these spaces that then determines that, oh, this investment is is worthwhile and is going to yield us, you know, what we want. So to understand that it's, 
yeah, places that have already lacked investment in various ways, have are in need of improvements um, to infrastructure mm -hmm. or to quality of housing, stock of housing, other types of buildings and businesses that then in fact uh, lends <laughs> to the <laughs> idea that, oh, okay, we can, we can make this place better, right? And probably make it better because our starting costs will already be low. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's the thing. Um, a lot of developers and you know investors in these areas, they come to these places and their mindset is already these places are lacking, right? They don't really pay attention to what's there, the people who are there. There's like, this place is lacking. I know how to make it better and I know how to profit off of it. So that's a thing that happens quite a lot and it, I mean in this in this society driven by capitalism where people use their private money and you know their focus is profit and you know get this done and I gain right you know and people will gain from this but of course it'll be the more affluent people uh never mind the other people you know who already exist and live there it's it's very I don't want to I don't want to make it sound bad, but it's it's like almost like a self-absorbed, self-centered kind of way. And I'm not saying all developers like are like that out there. I mean, there's some developers that make the extra effort, and there are nonprofit developers that you know work towards the betterment of communities. But it seems to me, from based what I've been seeing through my work, through the research I've done when I was in university, through some of the work that I've done through my work experience, that a lot of the common trace that we see is like it's profit driven they see something it's wrong with the community it's lacking and they have their own ideas and visions of what they think will make the community better and who might who are their target audience that may be able to benefit from it and unfortunately a lot of the time that target audience does not include existing residents black residents people of color and a lot of people who are marginalized so our final question our final question um, for today is around displacement and what it means to be displaced. But I know that you mentioned already, and I really like the way you kind of defined direct displacement and indirect displacement. So I wonder if you wanted to maybe, um, if you had any additional um, thoughts on displacement or if there's anything that you kind of just want to restate um, and reaffirm around what it means to be displaced. Yeah, so as I mentioned, yeah, there's direct displacement where, you know, people are forced to leave uh, because they have to make space for redevelopment or, you know, and there's also the cases of indirect displacement where, you know, there's increased rent, the cost of living is too high to live in these areas, the cost of living or the cost of, you know, be able to have a business in this area. Um, there's also the case of cultural displacement as well, too. You're bringing in a new, demo, like a new demographic of people, uh, a new demography of people. And there is also that, you know, the existing culture that's being there, that was initially there as people move out and new people come in, that is also being, you know, kind of lost or changed or transformed. And, you know, with all these, with people moving out and, you know, and you know the place is changing you know a lot of people there's that reduced sense of belonging basically that sense of belonging and people don't feel comfortable or feel like the home that they once call home doesn't feel like home anymore so even then you know they might feel they, they don't belong here anymore and might want to leave so there's that issue as well too and with all of these changes, there's that impact to social capital and social networks. So the whole nature of that uh, also changes the, the way a community functions as well too. And I think there are some ways to probably help mitigate displacement, unfortunately, you know, especially in within a Toronto context, you know, there hasn't been done much research done and as, and the thoughts of displacement aren't really considered as much as they should be when big redevelopment projects are proposed. So 
you know, ways I think of, you know, helping to mitigate some of those displacements, again, is through the community benefits uh, agreements, uh, making sure including, you know, terms in there to help reduce, you know, to have zero displacement. Uh, also things like, you know, places like in Kensington, where they have, you know, the community land trust, which takes a bit more of an effort, but I'm a bit of money to put community members and people coming together to purchase land. So they have that space to use it how they see fit as well too. Um, and I think also too, to help mitigate some of that displacement is to really identify, especially when you're proposing uh, redevelopment or any kind of development or any kind of change to community as part of your whole planning process on the part of the whole revise and redevelopment process. It's really identify because it's different everywhere you go, right? It's contextual, identify the risk of putting this development here on how your policies and how, how do some research basically into how you know that might impact people who live there and how to reduce displacement. Mm, that's very interesting because I think what I heard um, you share is that in fact it is there are ways to enable you know communities of people who have lived in neighborhoods for generations to stay. Generally, these are people who are probably without enough resources to be able to just stay, to buy a home or to own property and to stay. Um, that there are ways to enable these communities to stay if the people who are doing the development uh, put value on that, put a particular interest in doing mm -hmm. the work conducting the research, um, assessing the feasibility, if you will, of what it means to actually help communities stay. Yeah, right? and I'll so, add but, to that as well too, sorry. Is yeah, that... no, no, just to say that it they have mm -hmm. to be intentional in it. Intentional, in yeah. For that to work, but please go ahead. Yeah, yeah no, to, yeah, and it's not only like the developers, but I think there needs to be change at a government level too, because a lot of planning and development is guided by policies and legislation, mm -hmm. right? And the way that policies and legislation are right now, and I can honestly go on about this, but that's probably another episode, <laughs> is the, the way that they have, the policies right now basically do not give incentive or give, you know, ensure that developers, you know, really engage in meaningful, um, in, consultation of doing meaningful work with residents right the way that it's set up and also just the whole capitalist uh, society the way it's set up is that they basically just do the bare minimum and that's okay <laughs> do the bare minimum so right now the way that planning policies are set up it's just like it it brings about like a kind of tokenistic kind of process whereas in okay we consult with you at these key points in the process not from the beginning where as it should be right not from beginning through end and not throughout it's like okay here's a public notice you have 90 days to appeal and then the whole appeal process is just daunting and has so many regulations and protocols that it's you just don't want to do it you don't want to go through that mental rush right and I just think the way the legislation is because, you know, it's so, I don't want to say loose, but the way that it, the nature of it just makes it easier for developers, but a lot harder for residents to really advocate and be involved in the process. Uh, it, they're just seen as a checkbox and, you know, we move on. So yeah, I think there needs to be a whole systemic change and not only with you know, not only with like some of like how developers do things, which is an important thing, but also the laws that are in place to really guide planning and development processes to ensure the protection and engagement of people, uh, of residents, and to really facilitate that meaningful and uncollaborative work across all levels of government and even at the local level. Mm, so it sounds like it's not only um, 
just intention, like good intention to Mm -hmm. do or to conduct inclusive process, but that must also be supported by policy and -hmm. legislation as well as practice as yeah. well as the actual practice and the work of, uh, of meaningful engagement that goes beyond just consultation, in fact, mm-hmm. <laughs> but definitely meaningful engagement. So it's, uh, it's, de- it's definitely many, many ways and many um, and participants and bodies that have to be involved. It's in, uh, very complex. <laughs> Uh, in equitable in equitable redevelopment especially equitable redevelopment in um in black and racialized marginalized communities so do you have any final thoughts or anything that we may have missed that you want to share before we wrap up today uh not really i just want to reiterate that you know development redevelopment and change doesn't really have to be bad but i think the key thing is really examining the processes and the impacts, uh, you know, to really take a deep delve into some of the policies and practices to make sure that, you know, people benefit at all levels. And, you know, we don't exacerbate systemic and marginal and issues that marginalize people and exclude people, especially black people. And it really takes the effort to do that, but I think the benefits really outweigh the cost and you know, people's lives are in the balance. And I think that is, for me, more than enough incentive to really take on that extra work and do that extra work to help unravel some of these issues that uh, could really impact uh, people's livelihoods. And that wraps up our interview today. Thank you, Shannon, for joining us and sharing your expertise and wisdom on our podcast. You gave us a lot of great definitions and important terms and context for our podcast moving forward. For our listeners, we'll see you next episode where we further explore the impact of revitalization from both a business owner and resident's point of view. This is the shift, big change, big things in the phase, yeah. Big change, big things in the phase, yeah. Big change, big things. This podcast is brought to you by North York Community House. North York Community House built strong, resilient, and inclusive communities in Northwest Toronto. We help children, youth, parents, and seniors become active, engaged citizens who lead positive change in their neighborhoods. Find us at nych.ca.